Good afternoon and welcome to this event, which is a really, truly a scientific fist for all of us. Here we are going to showcase the latest, the very latest of the technology that help all our patients all over the world to give them a quality of vision, but at the same time making them less dependent or totally uh, independent of glasses and making them happier. Not that our patients are not happy today because of your skill and the support of the industry all over, but they are even now more happier and more satisfied uh, because of the technology such as the one that we are going to uh, deal with in now next 55 minutes. And I'm so happy uh, that Alcon has taken up this event and uh, we have a stellar faculty here, uh, Dr. Sanjay Chaudhary, a prolific surgeon and a great experience. Uh, Dr. Sri Ganesh, it is futile to introduce him in India or anywhere in the world now, but he is a pioneer in this very concept of helping the patients, making them independent of glasses and making quality. So I thank both of them to be here, but our keynote speakers today is Dr. V.C. Mehta from Mumbai, uh, once again a, a person who helped to develop FACO emulsification and cataract management in India over the last 35 years. And uh, uh, my very good friend, uh, Prin, uh, who has uh, flown across the waters, and uh, he has taught us over the years on various occasions for cataract and glaucoma at different parts of India and world, but today he's going to share his experience with this newer technology. So without any problem, uh, could I and, uh, ask Dr. Sanjay and Sri Ganesh to be on the podium? And VC, would you please uh, share your uh, uh, presentation with us? Good afternoon, friends. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vasavda, for the great introduction of the wonderful lens that has hit in the present time and helps us in giving spectacle independence to our cataract patients. What I'm going to talk about is the science behind this revolutionary pan optics trifocal lens. We all accept that intermediate distance is a new requirement for our cataract patients. If you do not address the intermediate vision, the patient is going to be very, very unhappy because most of the people end up spending time at this intermediate distance uh, on the screen. And therefore, we need to address this intermediate distance and this intermediate distance was addressed not by Alcon initially, but by other companies, and they came out with what is called the trifocal IOL. In fact, Alcon was a little late in getting into it, but the best thing was that the Alcon decided to plug certain gaps that were there in the trifocal designs of the IOL so as to make our patients much more happier than otherwise. So let me give you a little bit in uh, background into the genesis or the physics of the trifocal IOL. As you all know, Augustin Fresnel was the one on, on whose design the lighthouse is made and on whose design the, uh, uh, the diffractive IOLs have been developed. The diffractive IOL is nothing but a monofocal optic which is serving vision for the far power could be toric or could be uh, aspheric and on top of that you have a di diffractive element which then decides at what distances the patient is able to see whether it is bifocal, trifocal or any other form of multifocality. We look at this, uh, 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 the rings that are there on 
uh, on the diffractive element and there are two aspects one is the spacing of the of these rings and the second one is the height of the ring the spacing of the rings controls the power that means if you space it too closely you get a uh, 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 diffraction or the focal point too close to the eye. If you pay, place them a little wide apart, you get at a little farther away. So the point is that by, by spacing this diffractive ring, you can generate a near point wherever you want to. And the number two aspect of the rings is the height, which controls the light energy that it splits. So if if enough energy goes into the focal point the patient is able to see if enough energy is not there then it gets wasted or uh, it's not visible to the patient so this is an example of the rings being too close tightly packed you get a plus four diopter and and it is spaced wide apart you get a plus 1.75 diopter add so you can work upon the addition that these lenses can give you the other thing that can that happens in this particular diffractive uh, lenses is that number one, the 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 uh, wave uh, of of the light goes through uh, without any diffraction, and that part is called as order zero, and this happens to part of the light. The second part that happens is that the light gets diffracted, and we call it as order one, or it is for the near, and Beyond that also, there is order two, order three, order four, but as you go further down, the energy is so minimal that it is useless for the patient. The very important thing to understand is that there is a mathematical uh, uh, kind of relation between order one and order two. If order one is 3.5 uh, uh, diopter at the order two will automatically become seven diopter at. This is important to remember. The second part is the uh, energy that can be directed to those focal points to make it more easily visible for the patient and useful for the patient. And this amount of energy that goes is determined by the height of the steps. And this, the only kind of a, a, a factor that decides up, upon the energy that is delivered to that particular focal point is alpha, which controls the percentage of the light and, uh, split. If you take alpha as like one, zero. it becomes a monofocal diffractive lens. You have just Biotech one focus okay. and a diffractive so element without any second focus. But if you uh, make alpha as 0.5, you have then two orders. The zero order is the base lens that goes in for the distance, and the first order is the one that goes for the near. And apart from that, there are other orders also, as I had said, order two and order three. So what happens is 40% goes for distance, 40% goes for near, and the 20% gets wasted. And this is the genesis of the restore bifocal IUL with a plus three add. Now, if we want to get the third kind of uh, uh, focal point, then what do we do? You take two diffractive components and you create one with a plus 3.3 add, and you take a second one, which is with a 1.66 add. So the spacing is increased in the second element. So first element is 3.33, the second one is 1.66, and then you add this to it, and you get a trifocal lens with an intermediate, uh, intermediate of 1.66, near one of uh, 3.33, and, and obviously the distance. This is, the, this is how the uh, Acrylisa trifocal is made. However, in Acrylisa trifocal, because of plus 3.33 add, the, the 1.67 1, add, the intermediate distance is quite far off. That's around 80 centimeters. And when Alcon started deciding to construct a trifocal eye it, it it looked into the the need for an 
intermediate distance. And the intermediate distance according to the uh, occupational safety and the health administration comes to around 60 centimeter. Most of the average height people work at 60 centimeter. So it makes more sense to create an intermediate distance at 60 centimeters rather than at 80 centimeters. So how do you get the, to this 60 centimeters of the intermediate distance? So you take two different elements, right? One, you make it a diffractive element. You one, make it uh, 3.25. And the second one, you make it as 2 thirds of 3.25. That is 2.17. So the first one will have the far distance and the near at 3.25. The second one will have, again, the far distance and an intermediate at 2.17. And again, the further orders where the energy is very minimal, uh, so it gets wasted. So what we do when we combine both these, and then you adjust the height of the, of the, uh, the rings so that the optimal light split happens. And when this happens, you can see that there is a harmonic correlation between those three steps and two steps. That is 3.25 add and 2.17 add. And, and this is what happens in a quadrifocal lens. But the fourth one, that is the second or third order, has very minimal energy. That's about 4% energy, which is not utilized by the patient at all. What do we do to that? If you don't do anything, this energy gets wasted. So what Alcon did was that, it, look at this quadrifocal technology, and this 120 centimeter, where only 4% energy is there, which is not going to be of much use, it, it transferred it to the distance vision. So the distance vision had additional of 4% of energy, which is useful to the patient, especially when you consider a diffractive lens. So uh, when you look at this, this is the only lens we transmit 88% of the light at three millimeter pupil size. None of the other trifocal lenses transmit so much of uh, uh, a light at this uh, uh, pupil size. And this reflects in the patient's satisfaction because I have seen that trifocal panoptics uh, patients, they do not much complain about the distant vision. If you look at the bifocal patients and the acrylis are trifocal patients, they do have some complaint about the distance vision because in, there is a cutoff of the energy. Because the energy transmitted is significant, the distant vision is not much compromised in a panoptics lens. So what do we have here? We, we have a panoptics lens which has 15 rings with an intermediate uh, the, uh, correction of at 2.17 uh, diopter, the, the near correction at 3.25, and a distance correction. The, op the diffractive optic size is 4.5 mm instead of 3.6 mm. And this works because uh, if you, this is an ideal diffractive optic size because if you have less than this, in a patient who has large pupil or in a patient who has who is in a mesopic light condition, the pupil dilates and more amount of the light enters through the monofocal area and the intermediate and the near vision gets affected. If you consider a full optic diffractive lens, again in a dark condition, the, uh, the distant vision gets affected. And so ideal uh, optical uh, size is around 4.5, where neither the distance nor the intermediate uh, is affected. So we have here an acris of IQ platform on which the panoptics is uh, uh, built up uh, with an unique uh, diffractive uh, structure called as enlightened technology on a very pro one kind of a, uh, of a platform of Acrisoft with the biomaterial, biomechanics, and biooptics. And this allows us, our patients, to have a quality of vision for distance, intermediate, and near under all light conditions. No wonder that this particular product has been awarded as the best innovation of 2020 that affects the humanity as a whole. And this is, I think, the best time for Prespapia correcting IULs and giving the, uh, the cataract patients a truly uh, a spectacle free uh, kind of uh, uh, experience without the, the worry of untoward 
optical uh, phenomena like the halos, glare, and the reduced contrast sensitivity. So for me, I have been through all the multifocal, bifocals, and trifocal lenses, and I was really surprised at the results that this pan optics I will give and uh, I have been using ever since its introduction for the benefit of my patients who desire spectacle independence at all distances. Thank you very much for your kind attention. I think, uh, thank you, Dr. V.C. Mehta, for uh, uh, your illuminating and educative talk. This is a subject which is not easy to understand. Uh, I'm not sure whether anybody has understood, at least I have not understood enough. So this is, uh, you did a great justice to this topic. Uh, but I think what uh, the logistics or the reasoning you gave now will make us understand better what the Preen and other faculty experts are going to share their experience. So we'll understand and relate that to that, and we'll come to that relation and the question answered a little later. But Preen, uh, there's no better person than you, Preen, to, to share the experience of this uh, technology. I, I'd like to thank the Alcon and also the organizer and Dr. Mehta to make my job so easy. So my job is to share with you the visual performance and the real patient outcome in the clinic. I'm come from Bangkok. This is my financial disclosure. Uh, Alcon does not pay for my ticket or accommodation, okay? But they do provide a nominal honorarium. We, we all know that uh, 2020 is not good enough. Even you do the perfect cataract, people come back and complain because all the unmet needs has not met. That you have heard about intermediate vision and other things. So my talk will touch on four areas. We'll start off with the case series outcome. So I just jump quickly to the, my first 30 cases of panoptic. Uh, these are all non-toric version. So this is the patient series, the first 30 cases. Lucky enough, they're all female. And female has quite an incentive to look for near when they make up and other things. So I, when, when we all start the new lens, we will worry a little bit. And at our level, sometimes patients accept no surprise. And we cannot you know, accommodate any surprise. And these are the age and the case reading. Let me show you the for up two days. At day two, the spheral equivalent is not that great. But uh, you know, 91% is within one plus minus one, which is not that great. But, that, but this is the uh, number of cases that are good for analysis. N10 for bilateral means 20 eyes. And you see that, uh, I think the, the side of the slide is cut off. Can you, Can you treat that a little bit? Can you reduce the magnification or something of the projection so that we can see the whole? So we can see the, yeah, yeah that's fine. Excellent. So, uh, so the, I'll show you the uncollected and corrected uh, near, intermediate, and distant vision. And the outcome was not too bad if we correct that. And we know that Two days after surgery, perhaps uh, the refractive uh, status is not stable yet. This is one month. You see a significant improve uh, after one month. So every time if uh, we see the patient too early, and if the patient complains, just you know, ask the patient to be patient, because patient has to be patient anyway. And at one month, the outcome is significantly improved. And this is the post-op uh, unit, uh, monocular and bi binocular outcome. And we seem to achieve quite good, even more than one. 
Let me show you the uh, defocus curve. This is the defocus curve. N9 is mean 89 of the best corrected. So when you do defocus, you have to best correct first because this take away all the, you know, uh, biometric supplies and then, then make it best correct. This is the follow up. If you look at this, as Dr. Mehta has, has uh, showed the signs that if you look at 1.5, 2 diopter and minus 2.5, they're quite good. We got more than 0.9 decibel. Uh, 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 sorry, uh, the, we calculate uh, 2020 20 will be one. So the higher the number, it is better. And this is follow up at three months. At three months, all the patient achieve very good result, especially the binocular VA, both uncorrect and corrected distant, intermediate, and near vision. When I look at the defocus curve, and the defocus curve is quite true, you know, reflect what the desire is. So from intermediate to near readings, minus 2.5, it's quite good, and it dropped off at minus three because, because the lens was not designed to have a very near reading. It's supposed to be 40 centimeter dominant and 60 centimeter. So the range from 40 to 60 centimeter, quite sweet. So the patient has to find a sweet spot in those areas. It's more of the elongated focus from 40 centimeter to 60 centimeter. This is the binocular versus the monocular. Oh, at one month versus the, uh, this is the, sorry, the binocular at one month versus the three months. What's, what this slide tell me is that if the patient is not too happy at one month, just ask the patient that be patient. At three months, the result gonna get better. I look at the contrast sensitivity, and this is the machine we test the contrast. And like all the multifocus lens, the contrast of the multifocal lens is not as good as monofocus. So, but it's not too bad. When we look at the uh, photopic and mesopic, it's not normal, it's near normal. This is a sample of a case 65 years old, which I have mixed uh, multifocus. And we see that the other lens behave differently. So it seems like the pan optics uh, in terms of contrast sensi sensitivity, uh, slightly better than the former trifocal lens. And, and this is not new. This has been studied that, uh, by the Ruiz and Misa, that uh, Louis Misa, that uh, uh, when even compared to the EDOF, it's not too bad. So this new lens nearly perhaps employ the lost energy and put that into a better contrast, regain it into distant vision. Now, in terms of patient satisfaction, we did a survey, uh, you know, we want to look at the, the goal of happy vision. And happy vision doesn't mean, always mean 2020. It means that the patient can perform their activity or not. And this is the 17 questionnaires we look at. And the average of patient satisfaction is 96, which is, you know, for us, I think we can, uh, if we select the, you know, uh, appropriate patient, we can deliver such thing. When we look at the night vision, day driving normally has no problem. The night driving is not too bad as well. Now let's move on to the case study. I'll show you a few cases. Uh, this is one of the very early cases uh, that I have already implanted one trifocal in one eye. So a patient which is minus five, you know, whenever we have minus two, three, four, five, it's very challenging to put in multifocus because they are quite happy with their near readings because they are minus to begin with. 
and the left eye was like that, minus 2.25. So this is quite a challenging case. Uh, I did the first eye in 2017. Uh, we put in the uh, one of the trifocal lenses, which is the five vision visual. And this is the outcome of the right eye, which is able to get minus five to a low minus on auto refraction on the right eye. The left eye has not done. So back to this. Uh, I did the left eye in last year, 2019, and put in the panned optics, 19.5. This is the outcome. So when we look at 40 centimeter and 60 centimeter, it seems like uh, it's more favorable result on the left eye, which is the panoptic, versus the other eye. But let me remind you that the test was done as 40 centimeter and 60 centimeter. When you compare not apple to apple, then maybe but if you look at 40 centimeter, this lens is designed for, it outperformed the earlier five vision trifocal. And this is the defocus curve. The right eye is the former trifocus, the first eye, and the left eye, the second curve is the pan optics. So it seems like the pan optic, the left eye, outperformed the right eye quite a bit in this case. When we do binocular, the patients see quite okay. Uh, the comparison study, which I'm not go to detail, you can read all this, you know, by Gunderson, compare the five vision to pan optics, just go ahead, read that. But what it say here is that <clears throat> at certain focal point, one lens can be better than the other lens. I think for us as a surgeon, we have to understand our patient, our patient needs. Whether it's short arm, long arm, whether what type of work is that a PC user or you know, you know, people are different. And and then the good thing is that we can telemate and, and try to meet that uh, visual requirement of the patient. I just go to my last part. Oh, this is the second case, the panoptic bilateral. A lady, 68 years old, and then come for uh, use hyperopic contact lens more than 20 years, uh, use iPad for five to six hours a day, and watch movie, but not driving. So we discussed about the options, and then I did implant the, uh, this is pre-op biometry, and this is the outcome. So. The uncorrect distant vision, intermediate vision, and the near vision is not bad at all. But when we come to very near focus, it's 2040. And sometimes if we have the patient who on contact lens, we have to make sure that the patient have been off contact lens for you know enough time. I think we can entertain the panel on what is your cutoff one week, two weeks, or three weeks. And this is post-op three weeks, the vision become better. Again, the lesson learned is that if the patient is not too happy with the very early post-op, just ask the patient to be patient. The vision gonna be better, reassure them that it's gonna get better at three to four weeks. And if they are not too happy with at, one, at, at one month, at three months, there will be more improvement. So if that patient is on contact lens, we have to make sure that the patient is off contact long enough, otherwise there might be a slightly hyperopic chip. Uh, and this is her uh, defocus curve. When we do binoculars, it's quite good. And, and, and this, is, this is compare, again, day, day two and one month, at day two, maybe the patient was not to have the wow effect, but at one month after they adapt to the new optics, I think the outcome is quite okay and we can reassure them for that. 
I'm going to move to the last part, which is the I have uh, luxuries of using the Aura system. Uh, many of you understand Aura is the intraoperative barometer. So I have two Aura systems, one in each different hospital, one in private, one in my university. Uh, and uh, sometimes we employ Lensex as well, the femtosecond cataract. And this is uh, just to show you the last uh, part of the talk on the video. This is the uh, patient coming in, and then we use the Vorion to first look at the eye and then just send the data to Lensex. I just skip to the part that we use Aura. So this is uh, after FACO emulsification. And then, before we implant the lens, this, le this patient, we have pre-select 19.5, and then we just draw in the uh, barometer, ask the patient to look at the light, and then once you train, it's, 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 it's a quick procedure. It doesn't take that much time. This is real time, normal speed, and then it gave me that this patient perhaps should have 20 adapter, not 19.5. So we do that a few times, three times, sometimes, and then this is putting in the lens. I can share the, when we compare the outcome of using Aura or not using Aura, but, but you don't need this for panoptics because I think when we look at the ACON standard the company provides, and do our outcome with or without aura is quite reliable with that A constant. And this is the aura V link, uh, which is the last part. The V link uh, has more control on the surgeon, so you can see all these numbers coming up in the eyepiece in the objective lens. So, in summary, I think panoptic performance is providing satisfactory performance, uh, and that may be perhaps from the light utilization that you heard from Dr. Mehta on the optic design. The visual outcome uh, usually more favorable at one month, not the first week of surgery or few days after surgery. Uh, they're more accommodative for near and uh, to intermediate range. So it's kind of from 40 to 60 centimeter, the patient able to see, to perform that task quite well and, and could outperform some of the trifocal, IOL or even EDOF if you compare various study, but it's subject to patient profile, what the patient needs, what are their sweet spot, what they, what they want in their daily life, and uh, could achieve a more happy patient. I thank for your attention. Thank you. I think uh, from uh, both these presentations, a uh, uh, few things did come out uh, quite obviously to all of us, and that's number one, that this unique technology this uh, BC explained to us has managed to bring the focus at 60 centimeter, unlike the other ones which had a longer focal length. And therefore, uh, as we saw in the performance in the second presentation, there is, appears to be a seamless or a continuous good quality vision from 35 to 40 centimeter up to 70 centimeter and so on. So that is the advantage that the patient has in reality that they can see similar quality and that we understand why they do this. So uh, now uh, I would request Sanjay and then see Ganesh. It seems to me that we can offer more and more our patients this particular lens which uh, I was not very confident with the previous kind of multifocal IOL. So what's your opinion and what's your experience, Sanjay? First, uh, tell us. Okay. Now, uh, when this 
particular lens was launched. And I was making a presentation on this lens in one of the forums. There was a very senior ophthalmologist who has been a former president of AIUS also, who happened to be there. And in two months' time, he made a decision that I'm going in for panoptics. And this is when I was comparing the three trifocals in that presentation. So when I asked him, sir, what was your reason for going on for this? He says, well, this is the only trifocal which is purely hydrophobic. So, so I, what I could understand was that in the, in the Indian psychology, there's a, a growing preference for hydrophobic lenses compared to hydrophilic lenses. So, I, I must, uh, but comment. then there's it's, a scientific it's not a angle psychology, to it. Psychology, as you say, it's this real, real uh, reason for going for hydrophobic. As you say, the PCO would be very yeah. much less. So, so the science behind it is that in a hydrophilic lens, there's a greater incidence of PCO, and and uh, in a system where already there's a light loss, and the light is getting divided, a PCO can be very disturbing, which in a hydrophobic lens is a big advantage. Thank you. I think uh, just we dilate a little bit more on this material characteristics that you mentioned so well, PCO, but the design and the material both really contribute to the stability of the IOL in terms of its all the three axes. So when we have a toric component added to it, it will be even more relevant that this material and this design, that configuration, uh, will be tested, I think, uh, favorably uh, with these kind of uh, biomechanic properties that this material and the design has. So, Shikanesh, you have been using multifocals, and I've learned so much from you over the years. Uh, what's your take on this pan optics? And you, you are an expert on this multifocals. I've used uh, a few of the other uh, trifocals, but then what I like about the panoptics, if you look at it from the daily point of view, what is the common activity that everybody does? The most common activity that everybody does. Look at your mobile phone, right? And that is basically at about 60 centimeters. You're not going to hold it like this, you're going to hold it here. And that's something most people are on their phones. And uh, everybody, including, um, a servant has a smartphone these days. And this is something, this is the distance at which everybody wants to see clearly. And that is what the panoptics gives you at 60 centimeters. Because the other lenses are further away. And in our population, if you look at the average height, the average height is different from the Western population. The Indian population, again, the arm length is a little closer. And that's where it really helps. And that's what makes the difference in patient satisfaction. The other thing I like about this lens is uh, the design because the other trifocal lenses are basically plate haptic lenses. And what I see in those lenses is that there can be a change in the effective lens position depending upon the back contraction. And you can get either a hyperopic or a myopic uh, shift depending upon the size of the bag. And in large bags, you get more of a myopic shift. In a small bag, you get a hyperopic shift. But the effective lens position with the panoptics, with the material and the IQ design, it's very stable and that's what I like. Irrespective of whether the patient is myopic or hyperopic or the bag size, the effective lens position is fairly constant. So your refractive results are very important, especially in a multifocal, because if you're off by more than 0.25, then the patient is unhappy and that's, you need to hit the target on its head Good biometry, good effective lens position, a stable lens, very important for good results uh, with trifocal IOLs, and that's where the panoptics goes. I think uh, I can't agree more, and that's what uh, we all now realize, that uh, this continuous reading, 30 centimeter, 35, 40, up to 60, or even more, 70, is the same. While if you have an 80 centimeter focus, you can see, but that that portion around 50 to 60 centimeter, which is the common distance as you uh, uh, emphasized, will be a little bit uh, less crisp vision. So that, that I think, to me, the patients are very happy. Any comments, Prin and VC, on this, this point? Any additional comments if you have? 
when you start using the panoptics, we need to take into account the astigmatism, however small that it may seem to you before the surgery. So we have ended up using more of the T2s in, in, uh, in panoptics because if you leave behind even a half adapter of sill and add to that even a half adapter of spherical, you have a very unhappy patient. And mind you, I've done uh, LASIK post uh, uh, trifocal, not in panoptics, but in other trifocal, for a 0.75 cylinder. So we need to address this issue. If you don't address this, the patient becomes very symptomatic. I think this what, is what, very, what, very what, important. Abhay, what is your cutoff for sphere and sill for patient satisfaction with the panoptics? Because that's something that we need to be clear as to what is that going to be our target and within what cylinder or sphere we have to be to get ideal corrections. And I was thinking like uh, for the cylinder it should be less than 0.4 or so and sphere less than 0.25. But what is your kind of cutoff? I think this, 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 this two, the point these two uh, experts have brought out is so important. Please listen to them carefully. Uh, we talk about ametrophy and defocus on a spherical thing and that's why we want this uh, whatever targeted refraction, we, we convert into spherical equivalent and say it's a 0.25 or less than 0.5. But we forget that the defocus of the astigmatism is even more fatal or lethal to the quality of the image. And that's what these two guys are saying, not only in multifocal, absolutely in multifocal, but even in a normal monofocal lens, we don't talk about defocus astigmatism. And therefore, uh, we do not use this T2 and T3s. And all of these experts uh, here have their more component of T2 and T3 in their practices because astigmatic defocus is very important to treat. And therefore, uh, in multifocal lens or a panoptics lens, it's even more. Uh, I would say, I would agree to you that this is the thing, but in reality, uh, we are not able to do that. So quite often, we end up with 0 0.5, 0 0.6, a sort of thing, uh, spherical out of uh, target and about uh, less than 0.5 uh, cylinders. But we, we are improving and as you say, precision and all the steps and uh, I must acknowledge Dr. Barrett's contribution here. It's, it's uh, the formulas and all the stuff has really has changed the way we treat and for that regard, I, I must uh, disagree or sort of have a different opinion or aura that uh, the, the formulas have, have contributed so much now that the, the need for aura has been restricted to post-lasic or post-difficult eyes, if at all there is the role. But, but if you have it, a luxury, it's a luxury for us, friend. Having two auras, you say, uh, is great. So I think uh, going back to this uh, range that you would, in your experience, have it or accept it as a defocus sphere and uh, uh, cylinder, what's your uh, take on uh, it. Uh, what, what I'd like to share to follow on the toric city is that I find myself now today uh, for, for this panoptic, when I look at all the panoptics that I implant, is 60% is like mono without non toric, and the other 40% is toric version. So, and that reflects the patient that we have to offer surgery. You know, it's, it's if if you really calculate, and I, I, I do agree, I use, I verify with Barrett, for those who have, still have the IOL Master 500, you don't have that Barrett, don't worry, just go to the website and, and, and also the EVO is all good. So we recheck, so my assistant will recheck that again. If there's any you know, indication of saying that to put in Toric T2, we did. And that, that really changed the outcome to be much better. Well, it seems that the panoptics appears to be an answer for all kinds of patients, but I'm sure it cannot be. So, Srikan, as you start with you and tell one example where you would not consider panoptics, but you will have another option. See, for patients who are actively driving at night, highway driving, uh, I do not prefer any uh, multifocals or trifocals because there is some amount of halos and dysphotopsia, and these are some, some patients, kind of 70% of them kind of get used to it by a few months, and they're okay with it, and they're still able to drive. 
Uh, city driving is not so much of a problem because it's not pitch dark. You have the street lights. The pupil size, again, is uh, smaller. But at night, pitch dark, highway driving, high speed driving, uh, then the patients are uncomfortable because at, when they see light at a distance, then the halo is more. And as it comes closer, it becomes less. And these are patients who are troubled by this. Uh, so I just ask them whether right. they do uh, highway night driving. And this is one condition where I would not like to uh, implant yes. these lenses. Uh, the other thing is if, uh, if the bag is not stable, like if you have uh, subluxation, weak zonules, again, yes. this is a condition where I, because you need to have a good centration and uh, you should not have any tilt. So uh, this is, again, a condition where I would kind of not prefer to use these lenses. Um, because yeah, again, think, the post-op yeah. refractive accuracy also has to be good. Thank you. Post, let me yeah. see one more. Any yeah. uh, for you? So, give me one example where you will. So, so I would. Thoughtfully I would really think twice before I handle a very demanding patient who says, "I want a perfect six-six for distance. I want to see very clearly for near, and he's not going to accept anything short of it." So there, I would be after trying to dissuade him or uh, get out of the scene, especially. Professionals, let us say an ophthalmologist whose, whose work is very fine, I would say you need a 100% light utilization. So you would be better off with a monofocal than with a, with a okay. uh, trifocal. Yeah, okay, just hold on. Uh, can I say, just hold on. Hold on. We see one. one. Give one example where you will consider thoughtfully not putting. Uh, patients with excessive complaints of floaters. So if, if they come to you, with diagrams of floaters, be careful. These are the patients who will come back to you telling you how many rings the lens has. So, so those who are very obsessed with their kind of uh, optical symptoms and psychiatry patients, very yeah. depressed think, patients. I, I can't agree more like you. Any person who comes with a note and so many questions or drawing and everything, you, this is not <coughs> for you. Uh, for me, I, I perform topography in every single case before I offer cataract surgery. If, my, if the topography doesn't show me uh, corneal topography, corneal. if the corneal topography is not good enough, then we have the patient treat for dry eye, MGD, and ask the patient to come back <clears throat> to you know, do biometries, topography again until I satisfy. In case that we cannot treat dry eye effectively, I don't put in multifocal I, lens. I think this is so common. It's universal that uh, many, many patients have the ocular surface problems, and there are many devices and treatment now coming up for this MDD. And so I think this applies to all kinds of patients, multifocal, trifocals, and even any cataract patient, because you've done a great job, and you think you will be happy, and the patients are not happy, the burning here, and that sort of thing. So I think uh, the importance of that ocular surface evaluation, corneal aberrations, the corneal profile, uh, uh, remains still very fundamental in, in, in customizing the lens. Yeah, the the other angle alpha, angle alpha yes, I just wanted to speak about that. The angle alpha also is very important when we are looking at uh, multifocals, and this is something you need to measure pre-op. So I routinely do an eye trace for all these patients pre-op. So I look at the angle alpha. I also look at the topography. It's very important, especially if they have cylinder uh, and you're, you're planning to use a panoptic storic. All these patients get a topography because some of them have abortive keratoconus. And these are the patients you put in a toric panoptics, and then you can get surprises. These patients are not uh, happy post-op. So topography, dry eye assessment, angle alpha, these are all very important as preoperatively and a very good biometry. Of course. It seems that the pan optics appears to be uh, applicable to all the patients, but uh, as we discovered, you need to be careful. Uh, so in other words, customization of the philosophy of uh, this multifocal uh, component is important. So if the pan optics is not the answer for your patient sitting in front, what are the other options that you would think of or actually do it even now because uh, surely you will be doing some other options of IOL usage, mix match or a different kind of multifocal or a low edge or whatever. So what's your second plan? If, if your pan optic is not suitable for all the reasons you guys told us, what's your second? And I, uh, each of you give me one example each. 
I would look. I would look at uh, uh, micro monovision with like uh, non-dominant eye, uh, keeping it myopic by about one and a half diopters, and these patients are quite happy. Those who are contraindicated for panoptics. But but you both monovision monofocal lenses. Both monofocal okay. lenses. The non-dominant eye uh, right. minus so one. So monovision with monofocal. All right. Uh, Sanjay, if you have any other plan? Yeah, there are some lenses which are showing promise of being a monofocal but with some extended depth of focus. Yeah. So these lenses could be one of the options so that the person can see for distance and can almost read his mobile. So it's comfortable in his day activities but would still need glasses to read. Yeah. We see? It would be a micro monovision but we subject these patients to special tests like binocular vision and the inter-eye suppression test. If they are not able to do an inter-eye suppression, they will not be able to kind of uh, adapt to the monovision. If they don't have the 3D vision or the uh, stereopsis, they will probably also not get used to the monovision. You are a professor, sir. Thank you. I, I think the patient background is so important. What is the status of refraction before surgery? This is this dictate, uh, you know, uh, maybe more important than the what they need because we can customize the post-op outcome based on what they've been experienced before. Uh, if I cannot do mono vision, then for night driving patient, especially male, male are more challenge than females in multifocal business. Especially male that have to drive at night, I put in another type of lens which is uh, called uh, segmental multifocal. And those segmental, you can tell the dominant eye to be low ad and the non-dominant eye to be high ad. But, but that's, okay. that's another option. I, I do hear you guys talking about the halos and glare and driving and so on. But my experience is a little different, or maybe it's yours is the same. Uh, somehow, and I don't know the reason, we see if you know, explain, but the incidence of halos and glare is not as high as I expected or I was dreading with panoptics. Uh, I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, luck of this lens or Alcon, like uh, many times it happens, but the fact is, and maybe it's not a fact, but you may say it differently, halos and glare incidence is not as high as you would think with these rings there and I think for whatever reasons. Do you agree that the halos and glares are a little less than you would expect? So, uh, there's, a, there's a Hindi saying ki dood ka jala bhi ko phuk phuk kar peeta hai. That means uh, when we went into multifocal and we went into diffractive and refractive and the outcomes were not too good and the patients were on the surgeon's head and eating up a lot of chair time, we were getting a little skeptical about these uh, multifocal lenses. So, but when the panoptics came in, we were skeptical, but we were suddenly surprised that patients are really not complaining of hellos and glare. So, you, you agree? Anybody yeah. who doesn't agree, we have only yeah, two I, minutes. I think, Abhay, it depends upon the patient. If you are doing a refractive lens exchange, these are patients who notice the hellos and glare much more. When a patient has a cataract, he already has hellos, and his quality of vision is very poor. And when you put in these lenses, they are very happy because their vision has improved, their contrast has improved. But if you're doing a refractive lens exchange for a presbyopic patient, these are the patients who notice all the side effects because they have lost something. As long as you, it's, it's the theory of relativity. Like VC was telling, you suddenly look so young. I said, that's because I had a beard before. Now I've shared out the beard, I look young. It's, it's just relative. <laughs> but, but I think that the, the point is correct. But on the other hand, the f these guys are determined not to get rid of the glasses, this clear lens exchange people. So if they're not actually a driver or, or professional driver, so don't have to drive. In Bangalore, they don't drive. They just walk with the car. There's so much heavy also. traffic. <laughs> so that's okay. But, but the, so you can. So in other words, there is a motivation for uh, these clear lens exchange to get rid of glasses and they will not tell anybody. And they will ask the, uh, her com his companion to drive at night time. So, you know, you, you can make a case for both. So I think if there is any other one minute, any point that you want to make? Yes, one minute. As far as the uh, halos and glare are concerned, I'll cite one example. Patient bilateral panoptics, I bumped into him at a mall. 
So I said this is the best place to find out whether this patient gets a halo or no. So because there are all focus lights and all that. So I, no. after a few ex exchange of pleasantries, I asked him the million dollar question, do you see halos around the light? He said, what halos? Yes, I don't see good. anything. Thank you. I think uh, to conclude, I think it's fair to say that what came out today is that there is a new technology lens which has a potential and has already delivered in somebody's, uh, some people's hand uh, to cater for the demand which is increasing in our modern day societies to, uh, to get rid of the glasses or less dependent but maintain that quality in different light condition and different professional hobbies and uh, professions. So I think uh, the time to come now is going to be exciting. Uh, uh, but I hope the Alcon supports us uh, in that excitement uh, journey. Thank you so very much for your patience and appreciate your comments, sir. Thank you.